Hello, my name is Peter Hotsker. I am, uh, well, I'm, I lost my train of thought already. I'm the secretary treasurer for the association and uh, I'm very proud and honored to be here to announce or to introduce one of my very good friends, uh, Doug Hosteller. In uh, 2002, I started my PhD program here at Penn State. Um, and this was the first conference I went to when it was here. Uh, so I literally started my doctorate in May and went to this conference in September. And I, and I, and I do remember um, meeting Doug for the first time at that point. Um, he has sort of a rememberable face. Uh, so Douglas Hostetter is professor of kinesiology and associate dean in the College of Health and, Bio and Behavioral Studies at James Madison University, that is in Virginia. During the course of his academic career, he has contributed to the scholarly discipline of sport philosophy, the refereed journal publications in a wide variety of scholarly outlets, such as the Journal of the Philosophy of Sport, Quest, Journal of Emerging Sports Studies, Journal of Physical Education, Recreation and Dance, and Fair Play, Journal of Philosophy, Ethics and Sports Law. His recent scholarship focuses on the relationship between American philosophical strands of thought and endurance sport. In 2020, Hosteller wrote and entitled Endurance Sport and the American Philosophical Tradition by Lexington Books. The book was selected as the choice outstanding academic title for 2020. And I would say that my chapter was the best actually in that book. In addition to published works, Host Hitler has presented his scholarship at many conferences, both nationally and internationally, including the following, the International Association for the Philosophy of Sport, British Philosophy of Sport, National Association for Kinesiology and Higher Education, and the Sport Literature Association. Additionally, he has invited lectures, including uh, the following, Seeking a Truest, Strongest, Deepest Self, Youth Sports so Specialization in William James for the Center of the Study of Sport and Society at Penn State, uh, Finding Our Home in Kinesiology on Henry Bugby's Philosophy of Wilderness and Experience at the Ninth Annual Sport Philosophy Lecture at the College of Brockport, and in 2015, he had the honor of giving the 34th annual Dudley Sargent Lecture for the National Association for Kinesiology and Higher Education with a lecture titled Narratives, Identity, and Transformation. Hostetler has served as the editor of Quest from 2016 to 2019 and on the Quest editorial board from 2007 to 2016. In addition, Doug has reviewed manuscripts for Sport Ethics and Philosophy, Kinesiology Review, International Journal of Sports Sciences and Coaching, and the International Journal of Kinesiology and Higher Education. Hosteller is a recipient of other academic awards, including the 2018 Distinguished Scholar Award from the National Association for Kinesiology in Higher Education. And I affectionately call Doug Rabbi. Uh, if you don't know, Rabbi means teacher. He's always been my teacher uh, since I've known him. But a funny story, we were running a half marathon together in Huntington, Pennsylvania, down the road here. And Doug thought it would be clever to sign out the form, register for it as Rabbi Hosteller. And so what he didn't realize is when he ran across the finish line, they announced him and here comes Rabbi Hostetler. Um, so we got a lot of questions of what Doug's religious persuasion was after that. Um, he is not Jewish. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Doug Hostetler. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Can you hear me okay? Testing the mic, perfect, thank you. So just a couple of uh, comments starting out this, uh, I'm really humbled and honored by this award and just having a chance to, uh, to, to give this address. It means a lot to me, um, especially uh, being a Penn State grad, um, studying with Scott Kretschmar, um, being here um, on this campus for that, that means a lot to me. Um, knowing Warren and this award and, and Warren's behalf also um, is, is very special. And so I just really deeply appreciate this organization means a lot to me. And uh, um, so, yeah, thank you very much. All right, so my title, you know, get started. Um, and I was telling Scott Kirchmore this morning uh, that I was trimming a little bit uh, to get ready for my presentation. He thought my hair, I met my paper. So um, I tried to trim the paper. So here we go. In the late summer of 1993, as I completed my final course of a master's degree in physical education, I faced a difficult life choice. Accept a one-year teaching and coaching position at East Eastern Mennonite College in Virginia, or begin a doctoral program at Penn State with Scott Kretschmer. After a great deal of deliberation and consultation with others, I ultimately decided to accept the position at EMC and postpone my PhD plans. On a phone call with Scott, 
I informed him of my decision and he unsurprisingly left me with a wise and prescient thought that as a sport philosopher, the additional experience before starting the program would benefit me. Years later, after indeed making my way through the sport philosophy coursework at Penn State and successfully passing the dissertation proposal stage, I moved back to Virginia to both resume my teaching and coaching duties at EMC and also complete my dissertation. While at Penn State, I remembered once again my attraction to sport. In particular, I began to run in a way reminiscent of my high school cross country days. My plan during the summer of 1998 was to run, read, and write. Doug Anderson, an influential mentor from the Penn State Philosophy Department, commented that this approach would indeed be a helpful route to what he considered the best dissertation, which was a done dissertation. His point was that the ritual of movement was conducive to the philosophic process. My story is, of course, not unique for sport philosophers, nor is it unique for philosophers as a whole. In the inward morning, Henry Buckby recounts his experience as a graduate student. He writes, it was truly peripatetic, engendered not merely while walking, but through walking, it was essentially a meditation of the place, end quote. My overall contention is perhaps simple, even if it generally goes unmentioned. I want to remind us of the importance of sport experiences for our scholarly work. In part one, I outline the nature of experience and why this is crucial for sport philosophers and sport philosophy. In part two, I turn to the process of reflecting on experience, exploring how reflection happens and the import of reflection for our lives and writing. Finally, in part three, I move to the writing process related to sport experiences, the manner in which we articulate philosophic principles and arguments, even though these points may be written in third person, may also be informed by and through an experiential lens. At various times, I speak from personal experience and in first person. Following Thoreau here, I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. Unfortunately, I'm confined to this theme by the narrowness of my experience, end quote. When using personal narrative, my goal is to work not only deep, but also wide, connecting the individual experience with broader themes. In the parlance of another American philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, each of us has our own angle of vision, experiences which may enrich our scholarship and more importantly, our lives. My hope is to leverage my angle of vision to advance this topic of experience vis-a-vis -vis sport philosophy. American philosophical themes in general underscore and emphasize the place of experience as part of philosophical discourse. The various thinkers I reference within, Bugby, Dewey, Emerson, James, McDermott, should not be understood as monolithic, and yet these individuals and others within the American philosophical tradition represent a common outlook regarding the importance of experience. They remain open to possibilities that philosophy can and should relate to our everyday activities and concerns. Emerson, for example, wrote that the great gifts are not got by analysis, everything good is on the highway. Emerson's viewpoint acknowledges the importance of our human involvement, including our sport pur pursuits. James also advanced what Anderson terms a radically empirical attitude. Central to James' approach is the belief that all human experience is worthy for reflection, study, and philosophical discourse. Part of our task as sport philosophers, if we choose to leverage our experiences, is to carefully sift through the myriad events that shape our lives in order to glean the aspects which may in fact be worthy of inspection, reflection, and perhaps sharing with the broader community. I want to acknowledge here that the relationship between experience and philosophical reflection runs both, way as, both ways as it were. While my focus will be on the import of sport experience for sport philosophy scholarship, I fully appreciate that at times our philosophical reflection, our reading and thinking and writing impacts our sport participation as well. The latter is a topic for another paper, however, and my intent is to address the former. I'm not, I'm not sure who came up with this idea that the nightmare ride was a good idea, me or grad school classmate, Rich Lally. The name should have given us pause at least and perhaps influenced our decision to participate. Well before dawn, we arrived at Donegal Intermediate School, joining dozens of other riders for a 177 mile counterclockwise trek around Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Past bucolic Amish farmsteads, but also including over 15,000 feet of climbing. Even with our 5 a.m. departure time, the air was already sticky and an indication of the soaring temperatures and humidity ahead. A veteran of two cross-country trips, I felt confident in my training preparation. After all, I'd ridden numerous 100 plus mile days on these trips. Surely I could ride 177 miles in one day. What I failed to consider was that, that was, I was roughly eight years older at that time and not in the biking shape I had been in my early 20s. 
the first 60, 50 to 60 miles went relatively easy, moving south toward the Maryland border before turning back north near Christiana. Although by lunchtime, my back was starting to give me problems. I popped two aspirin, tried to shift positions on my Bianchi Alfana bike in the drops for a while on top of the handlebars, but nothing seemed to work. Vic also rode with us, a dairy farmer, strong rider. At some point in the late afternoon, with my back in sore shape, I told Vic to go ahead of us. Rich stayed with me. A strong Ironman triathlete himself, I have no doubt that Rich, Rich could have hung with Vic. Just after 6 p.m., after skirting both the Lebanon and Dauphin County borders, we arrived back at the intermediate school, completing the circuit. I still have memories for sure. My bright yellow nightmare jersey, right there. Pictures from the day. Um, Rich and I still talk about the ride, but our stories differ slightly. While Rich tells this story to highlight the possibility of perseverance through pain, my version of the story emphasizes the importance of companionship in our sport journeys. My, my starting point in this section is the nature of experience for the sport participant. Dewey provides a helpful framework from which to begin. He writes, everyday experience is the result of interaction between a live creature and some aspect of the world in which he lives. A man does something, he lifts, let's say, a stone. In consequence, he undergoes, suffers something, the weight, the strain, the texture of the surface of the thing lifted. The properties thus undergone determine further doing. Dewey emphasizes that our doing and undergoing does not operate in isolation nor in alteration, alternation. Rather, the experiences have both pattern and structure because of the transactional relationship between these qualities. An inclusive approach to American philosophy recognizes and appreciates the variety of individual doing and undergoing. The same doing, for example, may bring about different experiences of undergoing for the participants. The first time marathon runner approaches and undergoes the 26.2 miles much differently as compared with the Olympic marathon champion. At another point, Dewey describes experience as a coalescent process involving both objective conditions and also internal conditions. He places particular emphasis on the interplay between these two sets of conditions. Embarking on a trail run, for example, the runner encounters objective conditions such as the trails, technical terrain, vertical feet of climbing, wildlife, along with weather conditions, bodily sensations, and equipment functionality. The internal conditions may include how the individual approaches the run, with anticipation, with regret, focused on the trails, focused on personal issues at home, and so forth. This interplay between the objective and internal conditions, or between the doing and undergoing, occurs continuously. The runner may perceive one portion of an exceptionally steep climb as challenging on one occasion and as defeating on another. The variety of sport experiences we undergo, perhaps thought of along a continuum of sorts, range from routine and repetitive on one hand to memorable and novel on the other. Dewey explains this point when he writes, everything depends on the quality of the experience which is had. The quality of any experience has two aspects. There is an immediate aspect of agreeableness or disagreeableness, and there is its influence upon later experiences, end quote. Sport provides plenty of opportunities for memorable moments, occasions where we encounter meaning from beginning to end, perhaps a leisurely bike ride along a particularly scenic route or a long run with a close friend on a brisk autumn morning. As much as we may appreciate these immediately agreeable experiences, however, our sport lives consist of many occasions which appeared which appear mundane, obscure, and perhaps repetitious. Emerson describes the mundane and tedious everyday variety of experience in this way. Day creeps after day, each full of facts, dull, strange, despised things that we cannot, that we cannot enough despise, end quote. These may be the training sessions when we force ourselves out of bed early to run. The weather is nondescript, the scenery is monotonous, and the discomfort is annoying. In fact, these events may end up involving pain, suffering, or, or perhaps extreme weather. Think of competing in a sloppily played soccer game through freezing rain or completing an ultra marathon in unseasonably hot and humid conditions combined with gastrointestinal issues. Yet to work towards excellence requires a certain level of repetition and mundane activities. For some athletes, the repetition and constancy provides a level of routine which is beneficial. Author and performance coach Steve Magnus, for example, observed that great performers don't get tired of the boring stuff. In the book Ways of the Hand by Sudnow, he provides a phenomenological account of his journey to, lear to learning jazz improvisation on the piano, including hours spent performing various scales, exceptionally repetitive and tedious. 
only by going through this training process was Sudden Out eventually able to play at the improvisational jazz level, however. While these repeated efforts may be initially experienced as tedious, there may be a time when the same activity is experienced in a different manner. Think of the swimmer attempting to perfect the crawl. Initial efforts may be excruciatingly boring, and yet over time, the swimmer may perform the same drills with a level of confidence and comfort. It may be difficult at the time to fully appreciate the value of the so-called scorned facts or mundane and, and tedious sport experiences, yet Emerson encouraged us to remain vigilant to these aspects of our lives and further to remain committed to our human endeavors. Emerson does allow that at times our experiences with the rocks and other scorned facts of mundane variety may be viewed in a different and elevated status, he writes, and presently the aroused intellect finds gold and gems in one of these scorned facts. In reflection, we may realize the value of our training efforts. If the, if the doing and undergoing was monotonous and mundane, perhaps our future self views this process as valuable in terms of developing character or perseverance or some other positive trait. Perhaps the training efforts resulted in cultivating friendships with teammates or acquiring a baseline set of skills. Emerson's understanding of finding gold and gems runs close to what Dewey terms consumatory experiences. By this term, he means when the material experience runs its course to fulfillment, such an experience is whole and carries with it its own individualizing quality and self-sufficiency. These occurrences may provide opportunities for testing one's limits, creating a meaningful story, even though the immediate occurrence may not necessarily be experienced as pleasurable. Part of the process for experiencing rocks or diamonds are connecting the mundane and repetition, is connecting the mundane and repetition with a broader purpose. Norway's middle distance runner, Jakob Ingebrigtsen, provides an example. At his training camp in Flagstaff, in Flagstaff Arizona, he's laser focused on running, but little else. Cacciola describes his schedule after running. He naps, he logs onto YouTube, he breaks out his PlayStation console, he talks about cars with his brothers, and he naps some more. He knows his day sounds dull because they are, but there is a purpose to it all, end quote. Informed by writers such as Dewey, we may also think of experience in terms of its potential for learning. Some experiences may be educated and lead towards growth and development. For example, a young athlete may finish a training session enthusiastically looking forward to subsequent practice opportunities, perhaps a result of sage coaching combined with positive training ethos. Conversely, other experiences may be, in Dewey's terms, miseducative and infuse a notion of stagnancy, complacency, or, rigid, or rigidity and resistance towards growth. This miseducative experience results in arresting or distorting the growth of further experience, Dewey writes. To return to our youth sport example, the athlete may view participation as an obstacle and hold very little interest. Perhaps the athlete's parents expect the child to participate in Excel while the child holds a different view. Thus, the athlete ends up complaining about practice and dreads competition. Through, through commitment to sport practices, our experiences provide a level of knowledge. For the past two years, my preferred place to run is the western slopes of Massanutten, over 30 miles of single track terrain through part of the George Washington National Forest. I have favorite routes to Lee Heighton's Overlook, to Kaler's Knob, to the Nut Challenge 20K course. It's taken time to get to know these trails, to become acquainted with the terrain and the changes from dirt to mud to snow, depending on the weather conditions. Each time I make my way to the trails, however, I add an additional level of knowledge to my running story. It's, at these, it's as if these experiences were musical scores, and through the accumulation of runs, I'm layering these experiences like laying tracks and songwriting for richer and additional depth. This rich and influential sport experiences we accumulate individually occur within a broader social milieu. Sanford explains that our individuality is ever forged in the fires of our dependency on others. And the stories we tell about ourselves always take the cues from and include the stories of others, end quote. Our journey as an athlete, for example, is contextualized within the rich tradition of our practice communities. We begin to learn what it means to be a rower, football player, gymnast, or cyclist. This individual doing and undergoing coincides with others on similar journeys. We impact each other and do so within the practice community. In other words, our experiences intersect with the experiences of others. Dewey fittingly recognizes this social context when he writes, some activity always proceeds from a man. Then it sets up reactions in the surroundings. Others approve, disapprove, protest, encourage, share, and resist, end quote. 
Despite a commitment to respecting individual experience, this does not entail succumbing to a brutal relativism where the practice community cedes the higher grounds of individuals and just any experience. In fact, individuals who make demonstrably false claims about support experiences should be and are called out by others. For example, websites dedicated to publicizing runners who cheat in marathons. Interacting with our respective sport community, we share and test our individual experiences with others. We negotiate what it means to be a trail runner or football player, swimmer or baseball player. From time spent coaching little league teams, lifting weights, officiating high school soccer matches, we recognize that sport related experiences have the capacity to change us. For the athlete, habits play an essential role in this process. Myriad decisions and actions that the athlete performs repeatedly begin to impact the individual. The middle school student athlete who begins diving to test herself and learn a new sport gradually takes on the identity of a diver. This gradual process of identification occurs through establishing and completing habits. Dewey wrote, the basic characteristic of habit is that every experience enacted and undergone modifies the one who acts and undergoes, while this modification affects, whether we wish it or not, the quality of subsequent experiences for its somewhat different person who enters into them, end quote. This continual process of enacting and undergoing related to sport provides ongoing opportunities to learn and grow, to set goals, to test oneself, take risks and suffer or withstand the consequences. We're different individuals, even if slightly, after each training session or competition event. Another personal quote or anecdote here. I didn't have much Cat 4 experience starting in Category 5 when there was still a Cat 5 level, but look forward to testing myself in the Cedar Rapids criteria. The Eastern Iowa crit also lined up nicely with my sister's wedding. On Saturday, I dressed in shirt and tie for the wedding. On Sunday, I made the 45 minute drive from Kelowna to Cedar Rapids and donned cycling shorts and my favorite jersey, dark blue and purple Christiana Cycling Club colors. Gradually working my way forward in the pack of 50 plus riders, I navigated the tight turns of the downtown city streets. Two laps to go, I was in the top 10. If I could just hang in there, I had a chance for a notable finish, maybe even a bit of cash. With each pedal stroke, I inched closer to the finish line. Down the home stretch, and we were out of the saddle, weaving our bikes back and forth rhythmically, throwing them towards the finish line, which was now in our sight. Standing on my pedals, sweat dripping down on my face in the Iowa summer humidity, I glanced down just for a split second. That's all it took for a competitor to cross my wheel from left to right, clipping my front wheel with his rear one. I crashed amid the throng of other riders, skidding across the asphalt surface. Did I at least cross the finish line before falling, I wondered? Unfortunately, no. Rather than a top 10 finish, I drove back home with an open wound and eventually unsightly scars proof of the race. Things can and do happen when our attention lapses, however, even for a split second. Beyond sport, there are times when my attention, my attention lapsed as a father, as a husband, coworker, and professor. In short, these relationships and other areas of our life deteriorate, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, when I'm not paying attention. So end of that anecdote. Thus we learn from experience and make a backward and forward connection between what we do to things and what we enjoy or suffer from things in consequence, writes Dewey. Through our sport participation, we invariably make these backward and forward connections. How we encounter sport and physical activity, the things we see and do and undergo is important for our scholarly thinking and writing. Yet the experience itself is different from the process of reflecting on these experiences. In a sense, it involves two aspects of our identity. Smith puts it this way, using Thoreau as an example. There's the Thoreau who works his bean field, wanders in the woods, and hears the singing birds. And there's the one who reflects on these activities, taking note, end quote. Similarly, part of my being entails the individual who runs on city streets and mountain trails. Another part of my being who ponders, analyzes, observes, and writes about this running. We may not leverage all or even many of our sport experiences for scholarship, but the potential for appreciation and inspiration is there indeed. In this section, we transition to this process of reflection related to our sport experiences. Our stance towards sport impacts our ability to, to reflect on experience. Bugby writes of the importance of respecting things, being still in the presence of things, letting them speak. For the runner, being still in the presence of things might actually involve running. Heading nearby to the trails on, some, on an early Sunday morning, arriving at the parking lot before other vehicles appear, I opt for the Gold Loop, a roughly seven mile stretch of single track that includes a thousand feet of elevation gain. After a week in front of a computer screen, hours spent in the presence of others, these mountain trails provide an opportunity for the silence that Thoreau talked about at Walden. 
Some runners opt for earbuds and listen to podcasts or music while they run. While that may work for them and help meet their running goals, I prefer to take in my surroundings, both the natural presence of the trails and also the landscape of my own consciousness. This is where my most creative self appears, ideas arising from somewhere as I make my way up and down the mountain paths. If experiences hold potential for impacting our scholarship, how do we live our lives as sport philosophers with anticipation of and expectation for experiential insights to occur? Barry Lopez, a modern writer whose works garner comparison to Thoreau, provides a succinct recommendation regarding our stance towards the world. He writes, perhaps the first rule of everything we endeavor to do is pay attention. Perhaps the second is to be patient. And perhaps the third is to be attentive to what the body knows, end quote. This focus on attentiveness related to experience begs a question, however, attention to what end? Also to what should we attend? As we play basketball and run, lift weights and ski, how does attention relate to this notion of experience and how might this inform our scholarship? McDermott echoes, echoes Lopez regarding the importance of attention and offers the following. The only preparation here, although it's indispensable, is that we live our lives as always aware of the symbolic nature, nuance, that accompanies all of our experiences, and we remain ever on watch for even the slightest novelty in the message. Further, to the extent that we allow ourselves to hope for that moment, which sings uniquely, and to us, immediately, and then significantly, such moments will occur with frequency." End quote. Different sports dictate different forms of attention, for sure. Trail running, in general, requires a different form of attention, which differs from the, which differs from the same mileage or time on the road. As I make my way along single track trails, I choose my steps carefully, reminding myself to lift my feet to avoid the rocks and tree roots. I think of dancing with the rocks, a phrase I picked up from Eric, a local trail running veteran. Road running is different. With a relatively stable surface, often macadam or sidewalks, I glance at the changing scenery, but more often attend to the changing thoughts moving across my consciousness. My schedule for the day, thoughts of family and friends, random inspiration for classes and papers, and much more. Given the challenge of remaining attentive to our sport experiences, how do we move from our participation mode of being to our reflective mode of being? Keeping a journal is one tangible vehicle to record potential moments of symbolic nuance and for reflecting on experience with potential for scholarship. This note-taking process helps provide details which may be beneficial in the future for recall. Both Bugby and Thoreau kept journals as a way to remember specific moments and to work through their philosophical ideas. Thoreau took notes as he walked, and then, when finished for the day, developed these notes into journal form. On occasion, he would mine his journals for manuscript ideas, taking phrases and experiences from specific days and turning them into works for publication. Lopez details his strategy to take notes on a regular basis, not necessarily with a goal in mind, but because he writes, like others, I forget the details of experience. I retain only a general impression, end quote. Thus, maintaining a written record enables the participant to retain details of places and people, the doing and the undergoing. Athletes keep journals as well. For example, 2021 NL Cy Young Award winner Corbin Burns maintains a journal to reflect on and improve his pitching prowess. In his navy colored spiral notebook, Burns documents his outing starting with the statistic he terms execution percentage, the percent of pitches Burns thinks he accurately threw based on his own video analysis and reflection. He combines this data with thoughts on what he did well, areas for improvement and concrete strategies to get better. For endurance athletes especially, the Swedish app, app Strava has become an additional way to track workouts, keep notes and more recently pictures and video and potentially share this information with other endurance athletes. The perspectives from which we reflect on experience is important to consider as well. For example, there's a difference between thinking about, thinking about experience as a spectator as compared with experience as a participant. The Open Championship fan holds distinctive memories from the 2022 event at St. Andrews. The players hold their own memories, quite distinctive from the spectators. Both angles of vision are important, yet these different vantage points set the stage for thinking and writing. Bugby offers that reflection is a trying to remember, a digging that is pointless if it be not digging down directly beneath where one stands so that the waters of his life may reinvade the present moment and define the meaning of both, end quote. Put another way, this reflection stems from an intimacy connected to experience as opposed to some abstract or detached viewpoint. 
At our best, the rich encounters we undergo through sport participation permeate our lives and, when shared with others, potentially permeate their lives as well. The point is that this process entails our reflection on our own encounters with sport and not merely the stories of others. Emerson makes this clear in his American Scholar Address. He writes, action is with the scholar subordinate, but it's essential. Only so much do I know as I have lived. Instantly, we know whose words are loaded with life and whose not, end quote. We, could re we can recognize those athletes whose words are loaded with life. These individuals are integral to our practice communities. We listen to their stories, seek out their advice, and importantly, create our own stories as well. Each of us writes about sport philosophy from and within a particular contextual backdrop, or in Bugby's language, from our digging point. Where we grew up, for example, may impact our re recollection of sport in ways that stimulate scholarly writing, where and with whom we compete against and or train alongside they provide various means to understand sport. Some have risk sport playgrounds like rock climbing or snowboarding, while other, others gravitate in a more main, mainstream sports such as basketball or track and field. By sharing our own stories, others may realize the depth of our commitment and become similarly engaged. My philosophical stance today is shaped and informed by and through various contextual factors. I sift through and consider experiential moments related to coaching, teaching physical education classes, as a university administrator, as a runner, and as a parent of athletes. Each of us have varied pathways and life experiences that give rise to these moments that come to us as insights if we pay attention and remain patient. In his effort to detail experiences indicative of marrowbone truth, Bugby writes of several memories, swamping, building a dam, and intercollegiate rowing. Bugby came to college uh, without much rowing history, but it becomes apparent to the reader the activity left a definite imprint on him. If I'm remembering correctly, he's the third from the right standing. As part of his experience, Bugby describes his encounters with a significant person in his life, Coach John Schultz, pictured below uh, the team picture. Bugby writes that for me, Coach Schultz was the awakener. Coaches have that kind of potential impact for athletes at all levels. Part of this involves the committed and immersive nature of the relationships. Coaches and athletes spend hours together in the context of their pursuit. Coaches watching their athletes intently and athletes at their best attempting to grasp the instruction of the coaches. Bugby provides an example of how attending to the aesthetic rhythms of sport may give rise to philosophical reflections and arguments. His vignette of rowing, for example, provides a glimpse of experience set off in verb, an implication and sheer delight in ambience and an inquisite, exquisite intensity, end quote. He draws from this experience in order to more fully understand and explain notions of commitment and immersion. If we remain engaged in sport and attendant to our experiences, our time spent running and rowing, playing volleyball and tennis, these hold the potential for impacting our thinking and writing. These occurrences may provide inspiration for research projects, more nuance for our arguments, help us identify where theory and practice may conflict and provide empathy for a wide range of arguments. Whitehead describes his studies with Bugby, who was for him an influential mentor and awakener. This process, Whitehead observed, involved learning a style of philosophical reflection grounded in experience, recollection, and trust, end quote. In the process of reflecting on our sport experiences, it's important to trust the wellspring of meanings and those intimations that appear in our consciousness. We may think of potential connections between ideas that we come across in our reading with our own experience. After putting our thoughts on paper, attempting to describe these experiences through words and connecting with philosophical concepts, we test these ideas with others in the sport philosophy community, like these individuals pictured on the Zoom screen. We present at conferences, share in rough drafts and polished manuscripts, solicit feedback from others, and then reflect on the feedback given. We sit, we sit with this feedback, allowing it to wash across us in a similar way as the experiences initially. At times, our philosophical observations resemble a poetic process. Whitehead, for example, spoke to the importance of place for helping him understand and make sense of the world. He writes, there's trust that our perceptions and recollections come from a reliable place and that our voice can be attuned to that place. It seems to me that this is what Scott Kretschmar meant about my time spent teaching and coaching and its potential for a philosopher. It would provide recollections on which to draw. My task would be to trust my perceptions and memories as I develop my own philosophical voice. While Bugby found inspiration near rivers and streams, 
my basketball coaching experiences would provide inspiration for a dissertation. In his book, Sacred Hoops, legendary NBA coach Phil Jackson tells of his sister-in-law once watching him coach. She left in tears, later telling Jackson that by observing him, she realized that this, coaching, is exactly what you were meant to do, end quote. My own experience was dramatically different, far less noteworthy and successful by any stretch of measure, and devoid of the sense of comfort exhibited by Jackson. That said, my time spent coaching was ultimately meaningful and instructive. The day-to-day -day coaching position with practices, games, recruiting, and so forth, provided me with the so-called facts I needed on which to draw philosophical insights. At that time, my intent was not to coach in order to philosophize, rather my focus was on coaching. And, my, and on reflection, my scholarship benefited from these experiential moments. I kept the journal throughout the entire basketball season, entries I read and reread, portions which would eventually surface in my dissertation. This is a handwritten note from 1998. Um, in other words, coaching intercollegiate basketball for seven years helped inform my thinking and writing topics such as pedagogy and coaching and ethics. And reading and thinking about philosophical topics like ethics impacted my coaching as well. Thankfully, our sport interests may include opportunities for cultivating reflection. In her book, Acedia and Me, Kathleen Norris identifies the activities which, for her, give rise to contemplation and writing. She includes walking, baking bread, and washing dishes. I find this true in my own experience. Running at a conversational pace can help facilitate the meditative process, what Anderson calls musement, which he describes in this way. The pure play of ideas requires a playful attitude in which we allow ideas to work through us. To muse is to actively become receptive to the insistence of our ideas, end quote. While making my way, through dark and quiet streets, I invariably find myself remembering individuals or conversations, thinking of ideas or projects. Pace and place matters, however. When completing track workouts, my focus is on maintaining form and managing effort and pain with minimal opportunity for reflection. Philosophers, of course, recognize and benefit from the meditative aspect of movement. Rousseau, for example, wrote that I can only meditate when I'm walking. When I stop, I cease to think. My mind only works with my legs. I was going to mention, I did mention Thoreau in my paper. Thanks to Pam Sailors, I found out that Martha Nussbaum is a runner. Thanks to Paul Gaffney, I found out that Paul Weiss was a walker. So thank you for those inclusions. Omara offers a scientific rationale for the connection between movement and experience. How we move, Omara says, what we look at, who we talk to, what we feel as we move, these are central components to our experiences. They might enter our recall and be laid down as traces on our brains. End quote. Indeed, the process of thinking impacts our physiological processes. Even imagining an upcoming run, for example, spurs brain activity related to planning, but it also creates activity in the brain related to memory and imagination. Part of my process is to consider and then plan potential running routes. This often happens the night before an early morning run. I consider the type of run I have in mind, recovery work, recovery run, speed work, long run, trail run, the weather and road or trail conditions and so forth. Think about potential options, where I could go, and whether or not a particular route would lead me to the intended mileage. Throughout the course of our lives, from childhood through adulthood, we encounter different moments by virtue of our sport participation. We accumulate events as if we're picking up shells from the beach. McDermott explains that we somehow carry, and quote, all of our experiences ever gone. He writes, to retrieve them, we have obvious activities like memory and more determined attempts, such as retrospection, we're also subject to flashbacks, startling intrusions from our past into our present consciousness. At times, we can trace the relational netting that gives rise to these eruptions, but at other times, their origins are vague, unknown, as if they were self-propelled from our past into our present, end quote. We store these memories, and at some time, the memories may flit across our consciousness. After, after two decades removed from my graduate studies, I find myself at a point where experiences from teaching, coaching, and participating emerge now, while running, for example, somehow, and from somewhere, I'm reminded of athletes and teams I coach, students from specific classes, competitive experiences running or on the bike. Memories from high school, cross country, and college football seasons press upon me. I approach these memories differently now in my 50s as compared with my 20s or 40s. Perhaps Bugby is correct in the importance of timing as an important component for reflection. He writes, but reflection, it seems, must earn the gift of the essential meaning of things past. It's as if experience must continue underground for some time 
before it can emerge as spring water, clear, pure, understood, end quote. Hindsight may, may not necessarily be 2020, but viewing our experience as part of our memory may give us the needed perspective that helps provide clarity and meaning. Similarly, a lifetime of sport-related experiences provides me and us with the rocks we may need to add our, knit, our rich and nuanced quality to our sport philosophy scholarship. On occasion, the process of recollection may bring forth memories that appear as diamonds, even though in the moment of experience, they may have appeared as scorned facts. Doyle uses religious terminology to describe these moments of illumination. Doyle writes, the things that we remember best, the things that matter to most to us when we remember them are the slightest things by the measurement of the world, but they're not slight at all. They're so huge and crucial and holy that we did not yet have words big enough to fit them and have to resort to hints and intimations to even get anywhere close, end quote. And a story about the picture. I met Dave in the fall of 2003, a veteran runner. He had completed numerous marathons and trained regularly. When we started running together many times along the Little Lehigh River in Pennsylvania, my, my quote unquote long runs were his quote unquote short runs. We ran once or twice a week together for 17 years until the summer of 2020 when I moved. Our running relationship was forged through many, many seemingly mundane moments and decisions showing up, showing up for each other over the course of these years. We ran, talked about our classes and our students, discussed Big Ten sports, the Mets and Twins, provided counsel and a listening ear, and busted on each other whenever possible. As I, when I reflect on my experiences with Dave, there are certain occasions that come to mind. Getting Duncan coffee after the Runner's World Half Marathon, running the Harrisburg, Harrisburg Marathon together in miserable conditions. But I think I'm equally, if not more, grateful for the enduring relationship and the many hours and miles we were able to spend together. How amazing is it that two individuals could potentially create the time and space to run together regularly over the course of 17 years? In this final section, I examine the writing process related to our sport experiences. Mining our, our own sport experiences for philosophical writing is not without risk, however. Because our participation, our undergoing is unique, our reflection and writing remains ineffective if our experiences remain peculiar to us if our writing lacks any meaning or broader consideration. As Zinzer puts it, a thin line separates ego from egotism. Ego is healthy, no writer can go far without it. Egotism, however, is a drag. Further, experience can be idiosyncratic, and so we may be reluctant to trust or give credence to our experiences. McDermott, channeling Dewey, warns of the potential obstacles related to experience. Dewey stresses over and over, McDermott writes, that we tend not to trust our own experience to be significant, leading, warning, and revealing. In fact, we've been taught to either deride the importance of our own experience and therefore enter an incommunicative shell or from insecurity and hesitant sense of true worth of our experiences, we rattle on in a monologue as self-aggrandizing as it's empty, end quote. Further, writing about individual experiences may inadvertently imply an element of exclusion that my view as a runner, for example, somehow represents all runners or all athletes or all humans. My writing about running experience fails if it does not invite the reader to consider more carefully his or her own running experiences along with philosophical concepts. Rather than a monologue, the goal is to use experience-based writing to create opportunities for dialogue within the sport philosophy community. In short, if it's not used properly, writing from an experiential viewpoint may undermine the philosophical argument rather than augment it. Bugby provides a model for scholarship related to personal experience. He leans on his narratives to help unpack philosophical concepts. The experiences rise from his recollection. At the beginning of the inward morning, he informs the reader of his process, that he intends to trust the intimations that rise, and he says, just get them down. Thoreau's writings add an additional, additional scholarly model and exemplify the relationship between the writer and the environment. Drawing from his 1841 journal, Thoreau composed A Winter Walk, describing the crisp and dry and crisp snow under our, our feet. Beyond this faithful observation to nature, however, Thoreau also used the journal in essay form to connect this winter landscape to his own life and broader themes. In this way, Thoreau followed the, 21, the 21st century advice of Zinzer. So when you write about a place, Zinzer says, try to draw the best out of it. But if the process should work in reverse, let it draw the best out of you. End quote. Our sport experiences provide a similar mode of connection between self and the other, possibilities which include the way in which sport permeates our lives. 
Commitment to a particular practice community and to our scholarly writing entails accumulating numerous experiential scorn facts and rocks. Warren Fraley provided a stellar example of commitment to and identification with both the sport community and the, and the philosophy community. He told stories of playing racquetball with Scott Kretschmar. I tried to find a picture of the two of them playing racquetball or something close, and I wasn't able to come up with it. This is as close as I could get, so apologies. Um, so Warren told stories about playing racquetball and wrote ethical issues about ethical issues, such as the good foul in basketball. Warren recognized and exemplified the notion that our commitment to one practice community may help us develop virtues condu conducive to success in other practice communities. Additionally, Warren recognized the craft of sport philosophy scholarship requires significant time for sure, time without any guarantee of success or, me or meaning. Bugby speaks to this quality on a passage with on fishing. He writes, it takes many, many days of what may, it may, takes many, many days to learn of what may and may not be in the river. Let us wade right in and keep fishing where we are, end quote. It takes many, many days for us to hone our craft as sport philosophers also. Despite the uncertainty of not knowing what may or may not happen as a result of our scholarly efforts, Bugby encourages us to wade in the river. The fishing analogy seems close to a running adage, which says one needs to train hard for at least a year without getting injured to get a, get, get a glimpse of potential human performance. Some of my favorite seasons of running have been in the midst of various training cycles, following plans for half marathons or marathons. Having the training plan provided structure and goals for my weeks, an opportunity for setting many goals within the context of a larger race goal, a way to break down the weeks into smaller daily progress reports of sorts. Many days were mundane for sure, incorporating speed work, extended long runs with plenty of recovery miles. Following a training plan over multiple months without getting injured or giving up is not easy or simple, however. Like training for and running the marathon, we recognize the level of effort and planning required to excel in our academic disciplinary community. One does not become an expert in anything overnight. In fact, attaining a level of excellence requires significant time and energy even if it does not necessarily equate to 10,000 hours. Attending my first IAPS, then PSSS conference in 1994, program attached, I distinctly remember my first presentation to a scholarly audience. Confident in my presentation skills and the topic at hand, which was Mennonite high school sports related to ethics, I was apprehensive at the thought of fielding questions from an audience of esteemed sport philosophers. The individuals in the room were years ahead of me in terms of their overall understanding of the field. I gradually understood that to gain a level of knowledge, I would have to embark on an additional graduate program dedicated to sport philosophy. This same is true with our writing process. To become proficient in our craft, to incorporate our sport experiences with our writing, we continue the training process as it were, not succumbing to prolonged gaps in our writing or extended time off. We approach ourselves, we approach our scholarship in the same discipline regimented way that we might train as an athlete. We cope with the TDM in our sport training and scholarship in hopes that patience and persistence will in fact result in something memorable and or successful. There's also a sense in which this is the kind of life story I want to live. I found deep meaning in and through my immersion in sport and sport philosophy. My participation in both does not hinge on accomplishments or goal attainment alone, even though the goals provide direction for my efforts. Rather, I'm grateful for the process and opportunity for, for, to pursue both pursuits and align myself with both practice communities. Finally, Lopez identifies the kind of stance needed both for participation in sport and also our work as scholars. To describe this process, he shared his apprehensions of various scientific travels, scuba diving beneath the sea ice off Antarctica, traveling by small vessels through turbulent conditions. Despite the fears, Lopez realized it's not bravery that comes into play in situations like this. The question for me, he writes, really isn't whether I'm afraid, it's whether I wish to commit. In another section, he connects commitment to love and writes, Successfully locating the proper frame of mind and then acting is not, I think, about refusing to accommodate fear. It's about the cultivation of love, end quote. Lopez's connection between commitment and love resonates with me and helps articulate my sport participation. Racing down a mountain trail, I fully realize the opportunity for twisting an ankle or even worse, sustaining, sustaining a concussion. Yet I find deep meaning and love in and through this activity. I continue to train and race. I continue to engage in and with the, practice, the running practice community. I have a similar disposition toward the sport philosophy community. It's my intellectual home. Therefore, this project on sport experience and sport philosophy scholarship stems from my longstanding love affair with sport. In conclusion, I fully acknowledge that my notion of sport experience is, not, is, is something which is limited. 
My adult running career, for example, spans more than 20 years. And yet, while this represents considerable dedication and perseverance, still, I only have limited knowledge and experience. I know something about running at a particular pace with particular people in particular locations and events. I'll leave it to other runners to carve out and reflect on their own running stories. Beyond running, others will add to the scholarly discussion by virtue of their commitment to and reflection on their own sport-related experiences. Indeed, our individual and unique experiences help produce a more informed and nuanced academic discipline as well. We end up seeing things from different vantage points, from our participation and involvement with different sports and activities, and with differing philosophic training and approaches. Our sport participation and philosophical scholarship does not need to, necess does not need to necessarily connect. It's possible we could read and write in this area of study without any experiential attachment to sport. It's possible that we could run and swim and bike without connecting these experiences to scholarship, but it's a good life conducting research as we participate in sport. Now I have a few more miles to run, slower miles compared to 10 or 20 years ago. Um, these miles, um, but perhaps miles more attentive and grateful. These miles will continue to enrich my life as they have for years, bringing me into contact not only with myself, but with nature's, and others on the same path. Thank you. I wanna say Doug McLaughlin read a couple of versions of this paper before and he said I should just start running straight away and not go to questions So, Anyways, but I guess I'll stick around. We also have from the organizer. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvos, and really eye-opening and inspiring. And then, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess, let's see if I can articulate the question. I'm wondering, um, this is more almost like a policy question. I'm wondering when it comes down to trying to, to explore or experience the mundane or experiment, it seems to always to be um, something that's inscrutable, almost inarticulable. So I'm learning, you know, as a philosopher, how you approach those, those hidden elements and experience, which I really learned about them, you know, which is well, something I'm here, but I, I don't I can see what's working about it. If I don't, like, looking back to that quote from my, my therapist, where it discusses, you know, whether is this worthy or not, or even being felt. And one more run, one more, you know, race, how many can think of it. So I'm how do you actually approach this challenge? Yeah, well, thank you, Jesus. So let me make sure I understand it correctly. So the first one is kind of how to, how to potentially put into words yeah. things that may be difficult to describe. And the second, in the second part, the, the second part too. I it's not as deep as that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So I guess um, you know some images come to mind. There may be some things with images that may, that may be. Um, maybe there, I, I think there are parts that I think to, to the journal, I'm thinking of Thoreau, I'm thinking of Bugby in the way that they at least try to attempt to put things on words right away and and then um, to see if those words seem to, to reach what they were getting at. Not, I, I think I understand, that, but there may be things that, that are, are, are difficult, but I think that we can still work towards describing them, even that our words may not fully express um, what may what we may have um, maintained um, or or experienced. Um, you know that may be an advantage of something like the arts. Maybe the arts are able to um, the fine arts put into words or sorry put into a description or a form something that may be difficult through language for us to write. Um, I think I think that being in a practice community can help. I mean, if we even if we stumble on our words. Um, with and try to describe those experiences, maybe somebody else has been in a close enough or similar kind of experience. They may have some terms or phrases that seem to, to be close and help us maybe with that kind of back and forth, kind of 
further dig into whatever it was that, that we experienced. Um, you know, having said that, that that individual or those individuals may have seen things in a little different light, but there may be as, as part of that conversation to get closer. So yeah, thank you. So thank you for the presentation. I was really interesting. And uh, actually, now I'm searching to have uh, this uh, side project of the working to go to relation to getting those experiences. And because, yeah, they're difficult to put in words. And so therefore, I was thinking. So if you work with other formats and works in order to get hold of these experiences, do you have an experience with that? With with using other forms besides yeah. that? Right. That's, um, I do not myself, but mentioning poetry, that, that's a great example. In fact, part of this whole kind of you know deciding what to keep in, deciding what to use, Warren Fraley in the, one of the, his kind of recollection of International Association of Philosophy Sport uh, wrote a poem at the end of that JPS piece and put, used poetry um, to, to try to capture kind of his thoughts on sport. Um, but I think I think you're right. I think there's a way um, that that may help with with uh, this question. But using language in a, in a different kind of way than just we have. And there's, I definitely agree with you. There could be other other kind of forms. I have to. I have. I have Done poetry I, myself. I, I am not, but that's, that's a, a great idea. I want to maybe not use another, another style of this, maybe. Yeah. I wonder whether also young arts, maybe the activity itself is for itself in the expression and um, of works. Oh, what we're trying to actually understand as you see. It's so very fun and very strange and very. Even not in a way to actually explore the that experience without having to, to articulate it. And then they actually result in some work they've done. But I wonder when you have kind of your own rats or, or cycling or something that appears you've done, you know, engaged. But that's a way to express and understand yourself in a philosophical way, but the young name. Yeah. Um, I've not thought about that before. I mean, I'm, it seems like. Um, I, mean, I had to coach my running or cycling in that kind of way um, to use the actual movement form to express the, those philosophic thoughts. I mean, I think I can see how that, you know, how that could work potentially, but um, I've not gone there, so to speak. I have kind of have gone the other way. Um, but yeah, it's certainly possible kind of through those, through those movement forms to be able to, to do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, um, you, you touched on this a little bit in your conclusion. You talked about as as you're aging, uh, some of your body limitations are starting to you know, you know it's gone. Obviously, everything goes through this process. So, if you could touch on how as you lose some of those body limitations and, and so on through running, how do you make that connection then back to? Uh, continuing to grow and, and basically not become frustrated. Like, is there other levels of gratitude as you go through this process? I'm trying to focus a little bit on this. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, to some extent, I think, I think running, there are, there's, you know, some potential benchmarks or possible age grade kind of benchmarks. I'm thinking Boston qualifying kind of times, some of those age, you know, as to how age the, those, those times change. Um, how I experienced that kind of process was, you know, I kind of went down that very, um, my times were not getting fast. You know, and I was, I was working extremely hard. And as I, as I started to age, I saw the times not, uh, not moving needles, so to speak. And so trail running for me is part of 
um, you know, something that's a little bit different. I haven't done a lot of that prior to moving to Virginia. Um, and again, this is going back to Warren's poem about why for him at that point when he wrote that poem, um, there was part of the testing kind of quality. And so even just find it a different kind of a test. Um, and I'll still race and, and still but it's a different kind of form. And so a part of it is that is that kind of approach towards um, just recognizing that I still do like that testing kind of mentality, pushing myself. I still like the training process. Um, and and that the times may be different, the activity may be different. So, yeah. That gratitude, I think, is a really good point about the gratitude part. Thanks for the talk, uh, Douglas. I guess I'm, if I'm going to sort of look at what you're saying as a, as a bit of theory, um, I, I think that what comes to mind and uh, what I'm surprised about here is this thing about the blue circle. Do you know this? Okay, so this is from uh, Heidegger and the Gather by way of St. Augustine. Okay. It's, it's the idea that you approach a text from a certain perspective, and then uh, the text informs your understanding of the world, and then you move on as an experience of subject, and then the next time you approach the text, you have a new reading from the text. You can see one text. I'm thinking that what you're talking about is a relationship between the, the athlete and the practice mm -hmm. in a very similar way, moving from your own embodied presence into engagement with the practice, and then that kind of feed, that feeds back into your understanding of the self. And I think that what makes the world not just a chaotic mess of, of random encounters is this return to a practice that is more or less shaped over the life. It's, there's a special kind of knowledge. And even though you're always changing, the practice is always changing, that relationship it is, sort of, is a constant. Right? So I think that's why it's important to keep doing the things that give our lives meaning in early phases right? as we age. Even though the type of engagement that we're capable of moves with us. I think it still shapes reality to a, a comprehensible, possible whole. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that's what you're saying. You apply that. Well, thank, thank you for the thank you for the source. For first of all, I, I appreciate that. It makes I, I definitely agree with that. And it's the importance of continuing to go back. To that. Um, you know, I didn't talk about a gap. I talked about. High school cross country athlete, and then probably a 15 year or so gap. I didn't do a lot, did a little bit different, like, but that identity process and coming back to that has realized it's been more meaningful. And it's because of that, kind of, you know, on one sense, on one hand, a repetitive nature, but also with that repetition and that kind of further um, reinforces the way that the individual as a runner is part of that kind of identity process and identity in the, the best sense of the Form. I know pretty like an identity can have some you know, negative connotation at the time as well. But yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And I imagine it's like coming home and reading stories at that long and get back to Thank I guess why don't we uh, thank Doug again for a great time.